So we're in the midst of this series we've been calling Reformation, and, and we're essentially working out two foundational principles or two big ideas. First of all, the idea that you have been formed by life. You have become the person that you are today through your family, your education, your background, experiences that you've had, uh, sin that's been done to you, sin that you've done to others. All kinds of things have formed you and shaped you into the person that you are. And sort of the second principle we've been working out is the idea that you need to be reformed or reshaped by the gospel. That the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is not just about what happens to you when you die, but it's very much about the kind of person you're becoming right now. That the gospel is grace for you not only in the future, but in the present. And so what I want to do this morning as we continue to engage these ideas is to take a look at the very first step in reformation. The the starting point of the whole process, the very first thing that has to happen before any kind of change can happen. And that is what the Bible calls regeneration, the new birth, being born again. And so if you want to summarize in a statement what God has to say to us this morning, it is this. Before you can be reformed, you have to be reborn. Before you can be reformed, you have to be reborn. Okay, that is to say, reformation is a gradual and ongoing process, but it begins with a decisive, transformative change called regeneration or the new birth. And my message this morning has essentially four points, four things I want to do. First of all, I want to talk about the necessity of the new birth. Second, the means of the new birth. Third, the fruit of the new birth. And then finally, some counterfeits of the new birth. So we're going to look at the necessity of the new birth, the means of it, some fruit of it, and some counterfeits of it. And I think, pastorally, this this may in fact be the most crucial message of this whole series. And here's why I say that. Jesus warned us in the Sermon on the Mount, one of the most famous sermons Jesus ever preached in Matthew chapter 7, he warned us of this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Okay, so Jesus warns us that on the last day, there'll be people who call him Lord and who had experiences of being used by him in ministry. And he will say to them, I never knew you. So so it's very critical that we step back from what we're doing and from the ways that we're trusting and pursuing God and ask the question, have we known God? Have we been known by God? Have we experienced the new birth? I think the thing that Jesus is warning us about here is epidemic in American culture, isn't it? There are all kinds of people who say, Lord, Lord, Oh yeah, I'm a Christian. They would check the box. If if asked to choose their sort of religious persuasion, they would say, I'm a Christian. And yet I'd, I'd venture a guess that very many of them would have to confront the statement of Jesus, I I don't know you. And so if that's true in our culture at large, it's certainly true among us as well. And it behooves us as we begin to launch into this understanding and thinking about reformation, that we would first of all ask the question, have we been reborn? Have we laid the proper foundation from which all other spiritual change flows? So let's look first of all at the necessity of the new birth. John chapter 3. You heard it read already. If you have a Bible, I'd like you to go there this morning. John chapter 3 verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. 
Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So I want you to catch the clear, logical connection Jesus is setting up. Unless you are born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. You can't enter the kingdom of God, he will say again in a few verses. You, you have no hope of being a part of God's kingdom unless you have been born again. Uh, he will say again in verse 8, or 7, excuse me, you must be born again. So I, I just want you to reckon with very clearly in this text the necessity of the new birth. This is not optional. This is not a, a thing that's nice to have. Uh, being born again is not like a brand of Christianity, like, oh, you're a born-again Christian. You're one of those types of Christians. No, no. Being born again is what it means to be a Christian. And if you are not born again, you are not a Christian. You have not entered the kingdom of God. Jesus makes it very clear, you must be born again. How then does this new birth come about? If it's so necessary, if it's so critical, how does it happen? Well, I want you to think, first of all, just about the image, the metaphor that Jesus is using. What did you do to get yourself born? Nothing, right? Now, your mom did a lot to get you born. And those of you that are new moms here, you, you know you're experiencing that recently, right? But you... You were entirely passive in the process. You were simply born. Jesus is using that as the root image. What do you do to get yourself born again? Nothing. Regeneration is something that God does to you. 1 Peter 1, 3 puts it this way. God has caused you to be born again. It's something that happens to you. You are passive in the process. The theological term for this is monergism. That is, it is the work of one person, namely God and his sovereign grace. Well, How how does it happen? How does God bring this about? I want you to look again in the passage. Verse 4, Nicodemus kind of doesn't quite get what Jesus is saying. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Okay, now, Nicodemus is a smart guy. I don't think he actually thought this means climbing back into your mother's womb, okay? But I think he is expressing some level of perplexity at what exactly Jesus is saying here. What what, what are you getting at, Jesus? What do you mean being born again? Verse 5, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Three times Jesus reiterates What it means to be born again is to be born of the Spirit. So who is the causal agent? Who is the one that brings about this new birth? It's God the Holy Spirit. Has this happened to you? Have you experienced the Holy Spirit of God taking the word of God, the truth of God and the gospel and not allowing it just to be something that lies on the surface of your life or of your heart, but but the spirit actually bringing it to life within you? Have you experienced the Holy Spirit doing what we saw in our call to worship in Ephesians 2, taking your dead heart and bringing it to life? Taking a soul that is at enmity with God and turning it into a soul that loves and delights in God? Has this happened to you? Jesus says that the means of the new birth is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. 
working on you and in you through the Word of God. Before you can be reformed, you have to be reborn. And and notice this this image. Jesus is giving us a number of handles here to grab onto. Notice in verse 8, he gives us this image of the wind. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit. What he's saying is, look, this, this new birth, this spiritual rebirth, there's a mystery to it. It's like the wind. You can't see it, but you can see the effects of it. You can see what it produces. You can see some, some fruit. Just like when you see the wind, you, you see it in the trees and in flags and in litter blowing across the driveway. You, you can see the effects of it. Jesus says the new birth is kind of like that. You can't see it. It is mysterious. It's a work of the Spirit on your soul, but you can see the effects of it. So what are those effects? Let's look thirdly at the fruit of the new birth, or the effects of the new birth, what it brings about. I want you to notice the the very important connection that Jesus makes twice in this passage. In verse 3, he says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And in verse 5, unless one is born of of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. These are the only two times in the Gospel of John that John refers to the kingdom of God. This is a common phrase in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but John only mentions it here. And so anytime a biblical author is very precise and thoughtful in his choice of a phrase, it usually means he he wants us to see and reflect on the connection. So John is saying, unless you're born again, You cannot see and enter the kingdom of God. So seeing, entering, knowing, being in the kingdom of God is contingent on being born again. In other words, the primary fruit of the new birth is that I come into the kingdom of God. The primary evidence that I have been born again is that I am In, I see and enter the kingdom of God. Now, there's a whole fullness to the idea of the kingdom of God that that we don't have time to build out this morning. But, But in its most basic idea, what this means is, I come under the authority of God as king. I submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. I bow the knee to King Jesus The primary fruit, the primary effect of the new birth is I bow the knee to King Jesus. This is a disposition of soul. It's not so much something I do as an attitude I reflect. An attitude of submission to the Lord, joy in the presence and power and person of Jesus. Listen to Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of the great preachers of the 20th century, as he explains regeneration. I want to grab especially one of the phrases he used. He says, regeneration is a radical change in the governing disposition of the soul. I want you to just grab that phrase, a radical change in the governing disposition of the soul. Now, Now he's going to illustrate what he means by that. Let me give you one great illustration to show what I mean. Take the case of the Apostle Paul. Look at him as Saul of Tarsus, using all his powers to exterminate the Christian church. He's talking here about Acts 8 and 9. Before Saul is converted, he's an enemy of the church. But look at him later, preaching the gospel as it has never been preached before or since with the same powers, the same abilities, the same personality, the same everything, but moving in exactly the opposite direction. What has changed? It is not the faculties of Paul's soul. They are still the same. The same vehemence, the same logic, the same thoroughness, and yet the whole direction, the whole bent, the whole outlook has changed. He is a different man. You see what Lloyd-Jones is saying? He's saying, Paul has all the same aptitudes and skills and abilities, 
they're just thrown in a whole different direction. His life has taken on a new orientation. He's become different, not because who he was, all the abilities God's given him have changed, but rather because his direction, his disposition of soul has changed. This is why rebirth, being born again, is the starting point of reformation. Because it changes the fundamental disposition of your soul. All other change follows and flows out of that. So the fruit, the effect of the new birth is a radical change in the governing disposition of the soul. Now let's finally look at some counterfeits of the new birth. When I say counterfeits, what I mean are some some things that sometimes get confused with the new birth or with regeneration. As we look at these things, none of them are bad things. In fact, all of them should flow out of being born again. But what commonly happens is that we confuse these things with being born again. And I want to help you see the distinction and see that they are different. The first counterfeit of the new birth is spiritual experience. Spiritual experience. And many of you have had an experience in your life when you encountered God in a powerful way. Right? You threw a stick in the bonfire, you walked an aisle at an evangelistic rally, you experienced the presence of God in some unique and powerful way. And that's not a bad thing. You felt some sort of a spiritual high, there was some sort of spiritual moment that you remember that was sort of a defining moment or experience. Here's what I want you to see. The new birth is in every way a spiritual experience, but the fact that you've had a spiritual experience does not mean you've been born again. The new birth is a spiritual experience, but spiritual experience is not the new birth. How do we know that? Well, at least two ways. One is from experience. Experience tells us those kinds of experiences are not unique to Christianity, right? I mean, my buddy Tony smoked some weed one time and had a spiritual experience. You know what I'm saying? This is not, it's not only Christians that say, oh man, I had this weird moment with God. Okay, so I'm not saying that to be facetious. I'm saying that to say the fact that that happened to you may or may not mean anything. Right? That happens to Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Buddhists, Hindus, atheists. May or may not be the same thing as being born again. Secondly, we know this not just from our experience, but from Scripture, because in Matthew 7, the verse we looked at at the beginning of the sermon, right, Jesus says, there's going to be people on the last day who say to me, Lord, Lord, and here's their resume. We cast out demons in your name. We prophesied in your name. We did many mighty works in your name. Now look, I've never personally cast out a demon, but I imagine that's a pretty spiritual experience. Right? Like, if that can happen, and yet the person experiencing that is not born again, that should be a clue to you that spiritual experience is not the same thing as being born again. Jesus says there'll be people on the last day that have all kinds of interesting spiritual experiences, and my response to them will be, oh, I never knew you. I mean, there's this story in Acts, right, where the apostles have been casting out demons, and some people try to mimic that, some Jewish exorcists. And so they say, they they try to cast a demon out of this guy and they say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. And the demon answers, oh yeah, I know Jesus and I've heard of Paul, but who are you? And the guy beats them and it says they run out of the house bloody and naked. So the, the fact that you can do things in the name of Jesus, the fact that the name of Jesus is powerful spiritually, does not mean anything, necessarily. doesn't mean that you've been born again. You can experience the power of Jesus. You can even do ministry in the name of Jesus without knowing Jesus. Here's the second counterfeit. Moral living. Again, not a bad thing. But, But some of you think that you've experienced the new birth because you... Don't drink, smoke, or chew, or date girls who do. I mean, you live a good life. 
right? You, you're a pretty morally upstanding, respectable person. And so you, you identify that with being, well, I'm, I'm born again. I'm a Christian because here's how I live. Listen, some of the most moral people in the Bible were not regenerate. Again, the new birth brings with it obedience. But obedience is not the same thing as the new birth. Jesus says in Mark chapter 7, he, he's speaking to some of the people, particularly the scribes and the Pharisees, who are some of the most moral, upstanding, righteous people of the day. They're, they're not bad people, they're good people. Jesus says, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So he's saying, yeah, yeah, you, you have a really obedient life. You honor me, you speak well of me, but... Your heart is far from me. It's possibly very righteous, very obedient, very moral, and very much not converted. Moral living is not the same thing as the new birth. But here's the third thing, and perhaps the most challenging one for many of you, and that is this. The third counterfeit of the new birth is conviction of sin. Conviction of sin is not the same thing as being born again. The fact that you feel bad when you sin is not the same thing as the new birth. Okay? Here's why. What is it that makes you feel guilt when you sin? It's your conscience. Conscience is something that every human being has by virtue of the fact that they've been made in the image of God. In other words, conviction of sin is a function of creation, not regeneration. Conviction of sin comes because you violate your conscience. And, and whether your conscience is very active or whether you've squashed it down and ignored it for a long time, it's still there. And so, you, of course, you feel guilt and shame and embarrassment when you do things you know are wrong. But that in itself means nothing. That means you have a conscience. Good for you. You're a human being. You're not an alien. That's not the same thing as being born again. The, the key question is this. When you feel conviction of sin, what do you do with it? Those who are born again, when they feel conviction of sin, run in repentance and faith to the Lord Jesus. Take comfort and courage in the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus and the atoning death of Jesus on the cross. Those who are not born again may still feel all kinds of conviction of sin and guilt, and there's all kinds of remedies that we bring to the table and try to deal with that. Sometimes we try to forget it. Sometimes we go do penance and try to make up for our sin. Sometimes we talk about it with people, like using a priest as a confessional to get it off our conscience. None of those is being born again. Those are various human ways and means of dealing with and assuaging guilt. They're not the same thing as the new birth. Listen to Ian Murray. He says this, The work of the Holy Spirit always begins with the conviction of sin, but outward signs of, convictions of conviction are not to be identified with regeneration. The conscience of the unconverted may be alarmed to the point of trembling as Felix under the preaching of Paul, yet with no saving result. Murray points to the biblical example of Felix. This is in Acts 24. Felix is a non-Christian governor. Paul is preaching the gospel. Felix begins to feel conviction, says, hold on, stop that preaching. Uh, uh, that's too much for today. Go away. I'll call you back when I want to hear some more. He's feeling convicted of sin. He does nothing with it. I think there's an even better biblical example, and that is Judas. Judas felt deep remorse. You remember this? After he betrays Jesus, he comes weeping to the Pharisees and says, I betrayed an innocent man. He dumps back all the money they paid him. They say, that's, that's your problem, not ours. He goes and hangs himself out of guilt. Jesus says, Judas is a son of perdition. He was never converted, but he felt really sorry. Conviction of sin is not the same thing as the new birth. Now again, it's a beginning point. Right? It, it is something the Spirit does to bring us to conversion. 
but it's not the same thing as being born again. Spiritual experience, moral living, conviction of sin, these are three subtle counterfeits for the new birth. They're often confused with being born again, but they are different. So have you truly been born again? Or have you just experienced one of these counterfeits? Again, none of them are bad, but none of them are regeneration. The point this morning is really very simple. You must be born again. Before you can be reformed, you have to be reborn. And and here's why we're taking the time just to make this crystal clear this morning. Because as we continue to go forward in this reformation series, we're going to really build out a whole theology of change. We're going to talk about... How does change happen? How do you become a different kind of person? How does God take who you are and and transform you and change you and deal with the the folly and the foolishness and the weakness that's in you and, and bring to life spiritual strength and maturity? How does all that work? And my concern for some of us is that we'll get really excited about all that stuff and, and we'll run right past the starting point. The reality that you must be born again. And we'll get all excited about reformation and we'll forget about rebirth. All the other stuff we're going to talk about is built on the foundation of what Jesus is saying right now today in John chapter 3. You must be born again. Until that happens, nothing else happens. Unless that has happened, all your attempts at change will be self-driven, self-motivated, and self-serving. They will not be the same as true change. And so they won't last Jesus is challenging us this morning to see, look, before we talk about becoming a different kind of person, let's talk about getting a new heart. Let's talk about experiencing the new birth. Do you know yourself this morning to be a converted Christian? Do you know that you've been born again? Have you experienced, in the words of Martin Lloyd-Jones, a radical change in the governing disposition of your soul? Listen, my my sense is that there may be many of you here this morning who are unconverted. Some of you have been around church a really long time. You've been around, you've, you've heard stuff. You're familiar with the Bible. You're familiar with the gospel. But listen, God is giving you a gracious opportunity this morning to examine your soul to compare your experience to the Bible. And just to ask the question, have I been born again? Is what the Bible is talking about, has that happened in me? And here, here's the beauty, right? I, I wanna, here's my fear is that, that this can feel heavy, right? Because I'm saying, man, you need to ask the question, are, are you really converted? And that, that's a heavy and serious and weighty question, and my fear is that it'll send you into this sort of introspective, reflective, morose sort of internal conversation. I want to relieve some of that despair and that discouragement this morning by assuring you of this. It's okay to ask the question. Reality is your friend. There's no fear, there's no shame, there's no embarrassment in saying, you know what, I, I may not be born again. I've, I've been around church. I've heard some things. I've lived a certain way. But listen, I'm not sure that I am converted. It's okay to admit that this morning. And here's why it's okay. Because you're here. Why do you think you're here? Hearing a message on regeneration. Maybe because the sovereign God of the universe is seeking to cause you to be born again, and this is the means of that, is you hearing and reflecting on Scripture and reflecting on your experience and coming to Him. Okay, so if the answer is, no, I'm not sure I have been born again, that's not an answer that you need to hide, run away from, ignore. It's beautiful. It's a good thing. Because God is in the business of regeneration. The Spirit is here. The Word of God is being proclaimed. 
God is in the business of doing these kinds of things, changing people's hearts. And so if this morning the answer is no, you have the promise of Ezekiel 36 that we looked at a few weeks ago. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. God promises that. And so if you're here this morning and you ask for a new heart, take comfort in what Jesus says. If you ask for a fish, is a good father going to give you a stone? So don't shy away from confronting the question this morning. Don't don't shy away from doing the work of just asking, is this true of me? Here's Here's how I want to invite you to respond to this morning. If you're here and as you ask that question, have I been born again? Has the disposition of my soul been changed? Have I come under the lordship of Jesus? If the answer is yes, then what should you do? Worship, right? Sing loudly. Receive communion gladly. Celebrate this morning God's grace in your life. Because here's what I can tell you. This is the beauty of a gospel-centered church, right? Is the reason you're converted isn't because you're so smart that you figured it out. You get no glory, right? God gets glory because the Holy Spirit caused you to be born again. So celebrate that. Rejoice, worship this morning, if that's true of you. Remember the grace of God in your own story and in your own heart and in your own life. If you're here this morning and and your answer to the question is, no, I haven't been born again, or I'm not sure, then let let me offer you a couple of responses, a couple of things that I'd like to ask you to do. The first is this. All the pastors this morning are going to be up front after the service, just available to you. And so if you'd like to talk with someone, if you'd like to talk through your story, if you'd like to get some counsel, if you'd like to pray with someone, that's what we're here for. So you just feel free to come down. Uh, It's not going to be one of those moments where we try to close you, right? Like you're buying a used car, all right? We're going to respond to whatever the Spirit's doing in your soul, okay? And so you can be sure you're not coming down here to get, you know, get the deal closed and get you to sign on the dotted line. We're, We're inviting you, hey, let's process. What is the Spirit doing in your soul right now? So you come down if we can help you and serve you. Uh, As an additional resource, on the way out this morning, we're making a number of these booklets available. It's a little booklet called What is True Conversion? Uh, Written by a friend of ours, Stephen Smallman, who's a pastor in Philadelphia, uh, 30 pages. The best resource I've ever come across on this question. In fact, to be a member at Coram Deo, you have to read this book and you have to explain your own conversion story in light of the categories he gives. It's that good, it's that helpful, we want everybody who's a church member to have read through it and processed it. And so listen, we don't have enough of these that all of you guys can take them and go throw them on the floor of your car, right? But if this would be helpful to you, if you're, if you're asking this question, you're like, man, you know what, I, it would really help me to read something that processes that question, that's why we have them. So take one on your way out from the information table. Uh, read it this week. Process it. Both the pastoral council that we're offering and, and these booklets are, are endeavoring to do the same thing, and that is to help you deal directly with the Lord Jesus. To, to just help you deal directly with Jesus Christ himself. Because you can't cause yourself to be born again. I can't cause you to be born again. But here's the good news. If you see your need this morning to be born again, that's evidence that God is probably already at work doing just that. Jesus says, come to me. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I'm not going to cast you out. I'm not going to forsake you. Come to me. And so I can assure you this morning, if you come to him with your question of, what does it mean to be born again? Like Nicodemus, he will receive you in grace. And his spirit is at work to do just that in you. The great theologian J.I. Packer gives some wonderful counsel to, to those who are wrestling with this question to those who see their need for Christ and are wondering, what do I do? 
How do I respond? Listen to this counsel. To the question, what must I do to be saved? The old gospel replies, belief on the Lord Jesus Christ. And to the further question, how am I to go about believing on Christ and repenting if I have no natural ability to do these things? Okay, so the question he's, he's addressing is, how do I get born again if I have to get born again? Right? Like, if I can't do this, what do I do? Listen to his answer. Look to Christ. Speak to Christ. Cry to Christ just as you are. Confess your sin, your impenitence, your unbelief, and cast yourself on his mercy. Ask him to give you a new heart. Ask him to give you a new heart. And take courage in the promise of Ezekiel 36. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. This is the almighty, sovereign God promising that he does just that. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, for those of us here this morning who have been born again, we're reminded from Jesus' words in John chapter 3 that that is a work of your Holy Spirit. And so we're reminded once again that we didn't cause that, we didn't merit that, we didn't accomplish that. You, in your grace, have favored us. And would you cause that to deepen our humility and our worship this morning? Father, I want to pray for my, my friends here this morning who perhaps are not yet born again. I want to pray for those who are fearful of asking that question. I want to pray that you would pour out grace on them and help them to see that the only reason they would be hearing this sermon and confronting these questions is out of your grace and mercy to draw them to yourself. And I want to pray for those who perhaps are still hardened, perhaps still don't want to trust you. Their, their hearts are embittered against you for some reason. I pray that by your spirit, you'd be softening their hearts. God, would you bring new birth? Would you help us not be a people who say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all kinds of great things in your name and hear the response, I never knew you. Would you help us before we go on to thinking about all the ways that we need to be reformed and changed by your grace? Would you help us, first of all, to be reborn? For those of us for, those of us for whom that has happened, would you empower our worship now? And for those for whom it has yet to happen, would you give us the humility of mind and the strength of heart to take you at your word? ask that you would give us a new heart. Amen.